Hello and welcome to my new video. This time I will speak about modeling a structure where elements are influencing each other's shape. I will speak about modeling plant cell tissues. Soap bubbles can serve as simple models for the shape of cells, so we will start with modeling soap bubbles. A single soap bubble is easy. It is just an ideal sphere, but what about two bubbles attached to each other? They are spherical on the outside, but the contact zone is a thin, straight line. How can we model this? Blobs are ideal for this task. Components of blobs, spheres or cylinders are filled with a field of decreasing strength from the center to the periphery. When producing a blob, you are simply adding up the fields of the various components. Places where the field is above a certain threshold are regarded as within the blob. Places where the field is below the threshold are regarded as outside the blob. The important point in our context is that apart from combining the fields of elements, you can also subtract fields of certain elements. With this information, we can start modeling our simple two-bubble system. Each bubble is modeled separately, so we need one blob for the red bubble and one blob for the green bubble. At first hand, each of the bubbles consists of one big sphere. This sphere, however, is pressed by the adjacent bubble, resulting in a thin straight border between the two spheres. To simulate this, we have to subtract a sphere located at the place of the other bubble from the sphere representing each bubble. By playing around with the radius and the negative strength of this subtracted sphere, we can reach a thin straight border between the two bubbles pretty similar to reality. Cells within a tissue can also be regarded as spheres pushing each other. For modeling them, we will directly adopt the approach just established for soap bubbles. So when modeling a cellular tissue, we will also represent each shell by its own blob consisting of one central sphere with a positive field and several other spheres with negative fields representing pressure from adjacent cells. Before thinking about how many of those cells we might need, etc., we should first think about the steric arrangement of cells in such a tissue. We start with a regular 3D grid with a small amount of variation added to each element's position. Since the cells have a higher length when compared to their height or width, points have larger distances in X when compared to Y or Z directions. Let's look at this arrangement as if it was composed of cell columns alternating red ones and green ones. For resembling plant tissues, we have to modify the simple 3D grid. We have to push all green cells by half a cell diameter downwards. This results, as we will see, in a distribution resembling the distribution typical for example for the root cortex. Once we have obtained this distribution, we start our cellular blobs with a central sphere scaled by the factor of 2 in x direction. Similar as for soap bubbles, we define subtractive sphere for each location where a given cell is in contact with another cell. Theoretically, it is possible to define all these positions of contact explicitly. For me, this task appeared too difficult and I rather relied on another approach. For each cell, I searched the array containing the positions of the distribution for positions up to a certain maximum distance. These positions were then used for placing subtractive spheres. After carefully adjusting parameters, radius and negative values of spheres, I obtained a group of blobs not touch touching each other with more or less reasonably thin intercellular spaces. After inverting the structure, subtracting the cells from a larger body, you can also study the quality of the cell walls. One caveat remains, however, the whole approach only works as long as the variability of cellular positions is not too large. When differences between individual cells become too large, there will be thick intercellular spaces at some places and holes in the cell walls at others. That's all for today. What's next? I come back to interactions where a given element influences location and orientation of other elements. Remember the worm we created by having elements influencing subsequent elements? Now we are doing the same thing, except that each element will direct two subsequent elements. This way we will come to dichotomous, dichotomously branch structures and eventually even to relatively natural branch structures. I will talk about this in my next video. So stay tuned.